There are many different ways in which you can lay out your home network. They all work in similar ways with just a few variations in the types of hardware used and how your devices will ultimately be able to access the internet. In this video, we'll take a look at nine different home network layouts for you to consider. I'll provide a diagram of each, some pros and cons, and some tips for when you come to set it all up. Hey everyone, it's Chris here from homenetworkgeek.com where we cover everything home networking. If you enjoy the video and find it helpful, be sure to drop it a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Now let's jump straight in with our first layout. For a device to be able to communicate with a wireless router, it must have a wireless network adapter. This could be built into the device itself, like you'd find with a laptop, or it could be external. A USB Wi-Fi dongle that you plug into a desktop PC is an example of this. The router that is used to connect to the modem must also have a wireless adapter for it to be able to share the internet connection wirelessly. Without this, you'll have to resort to using physical cables. Modern wireless routers will allow for many devices to connect to it over a Wi-Fi connection. So don't be concerned that you have too many devices in this regard. The router will likely be able to handle the request just fine. Do keep in mind though, that if all the devices are trying to access the wireless network at the same time, you could see a hit in performance. This is where the router has to handle multiple requests at the same time. An MU MIMO router can come in really handy in this case, as this allows it to handle the requests at the same time. Now, most, if not all, wireless routers will still allow you to connect devices wirelessly, thanks to the built-in ethernet ports found on the back. There may come a time where you need to connect your laptop or your PC to your router using a physical cable before you can configure the wireless properties of the router. Once this has been set up, you then have the choice of using wireless or continuing to use the ethernet ports on the back. That being said, it makes sense to continue using the ethernet ports when the devices you're using either don't support Wi-Fi or can't maintain a strong enough Wi-Fi signal to work properly. Now the limiting factor with this layout is that the range of the Wi-Fi signal that the router emits usually isn't the best. It can vary drastically between different manufacturers of routers and even different models from the same manufacturer. External factors such as the materials used throughout your home or even external objects like microwaves which can interfere with a Wi-Fi connection won't help this either. As we've just discussed, a standard router will come with a handful of built-in Ethernet ports which allow you to connect devices directly to the router itself. Now in order for a device to be able to connect it using Ethernet, it must have an Ethernet network adapter. If it doesn't have one built in, like a smartphone for example, or there isn't any external adapters available, you'll be stuck to using a wireless connection. Take a look on the back of your router and you'll probably find one that's either labelled differently or is painted a different colour. This port is often reserved for establishing a connection between the router and the modem itself, so if you were to plug in a standard device like your gaming PC, you'd find it wouldn't work. Now the number of ethernet ports found on the back of your router won't be enough for most people, especially if you're not using Wi-Fi. This is where a network switch can come in incredibly handy, expanding the number of physical ethernet ports available to you. In terms of ethernet itself, it generally provides better performance than Wi-Fi and is more stable when it comes to the connection. With Wi-Fi, there's a chance that the signal strength can vary quite a bit or even drop completely. One thing to keep in mind if you're using an ethernet only network layout is that a single run of ethernet cable is designed to work up to a maximum distance of 100 meters. There are also different types of ethernet cable which can limit the network speeds that you can receive. The more recent CAT6 and CAT6A cables can deliver a maximum speeds of 10 gigabits per second Cat5e can deliver 1 gigabit per second, and the older Cat5 cable is limited to just 100 megabits per second. Now for most people, Cat5e cable will be perfectly suitable. Now personally, I wouldn't restrict myself to just an ethernet only network layout, as using Wi-Fi is simply too convenient. And to be honest, you'd probably struggle to find a router that doesn't have a wireless capability anyway. Probably the most commonly used network setup is a hybrid of wireless and ethernet connections. Given that the majority, if not all of routers these days have Wi-Fi capability and ethernet ports, you can easily make use of both at the same time. The wireless component will allow you to connect lots of different devices throughout your home wirelessly, whilst the ethernet ports can be reserved for the devices that need it, like a smart home app, or your most used devices, or those that require the best possible connection, like your gaming PC. Now the same limitations that apply to both ethernet only and wireless only layouts apply here. You need to position the router somewhere in your home where it provides the best wireless coverage, and you also may need to 
invest in a network switch if you find the number of ethernet ports on the router itself isn't quite enough. Now if you don't currently have a router, it is technically possible to connect a device that has a working ethernet adapter to the modem and for it to receive an internet connection. When your device is connected directly to the modem, it's connected to your internet service provider and from there the internet. Connectivity wise, there's nothing wrong with this setup as you'll be able to access the internet just like you would as if you were connected to your router. It's certainly not the recommended network layout to adopt though and should be avoided at all costs. The huge drawback to using this type of layout is the massive security risk that it presents. When your device is connecting directly to your modem, it will be left exposed out on the internet. The IP address that's assigned to your modem, which is also known as your public IP address, will resolve directly to that device. That means any vulnerabilities that are present on the device, like a port being left open or a vulnerability in the operating system, are potentially accessible to anyone that knows your public IP address. Now the chances that anyone knows your public IP address are relatively low, but it's certainly not a chance I would want to take. When you're connected directly to your modem, you're reliant 100% on the security features of that device itself. Now this could be protection that's built into the operating system itself, or a third party piece of software that you have installed. But both of these have been found to be pretty ineffective against protection from cyber criminals. Now my advice would be to forget that this type of network layout even exists and to always be using a router as part of your setup. Not only will the router allow you to have multiple devices connecting to the internet at the same time, but the firewall protection that's built into it has been found to be much more effective. And it also disassociates all of your individual devices with your public IP address. Incorporating a network switch into your home network expands the number of ethernet ports that are available to you. So as you now know, this generally provides better performance than Wi-Fi, and you don't have to worry about the potentially varying Wi-Fi signal strength. Now switches can be managed or unmanaged, both of which come with different features and configuration options. They will often vary quite a bit in price too, with the managed switches being the more expensive type. Now smart switches sit in between managed and unmanaged switches, both in terms of the cost to buy and the features they have available. This is the type of switch I would recommend for most people, as it comes with the more useful features that you'd find in a managed switch, but without the higher price tag. Now realistically, you would keep your network switch powered on and running 24 seven for convenience and so that all of your devices can access the internet whenever you need them. But what can concern some people is how much electricity they'll use and ultimately how much they cost to run. Now ethernet switches don't actually use very much electricity at all, varying between around 15 and 30 watts of power, which equates to very little in the grand scheme of your total energy bills. Despite them all providing the same basic functionality of additional ethernet ports, some switches will be designed in a certain way to suit certain people's needs. For example, you could have a switch that offers lower latency, which is good for gamers, or a PoE switch, which is great for delivering both the power and data that certain devices like IP cameras or wireless access points need. Now a regular wireless router will generally provide a good enough range and a suitable number of connections for most people. But if you have a particularly large home or lots of devices that you need to connect, you may want to consider investing in a wireless access point. They can come in really handy when you have a certain area of your home where the Wi-Fi signal is particularly weak or you receive no Wi-Fi signal whatsoever, which is known as a dead zone. A wireless access point works by connecting to your router using an ethernet cable, which provides it with the internet connection and the bandwidth that it needs to function. It will then transmit and receive a wireless signal on usually both the 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz frequency bands. The WAP will then allow you to connect devices wirelessly to your local area network, where it previously may not have been possible because of the signal strength. There are several benefits that come with using a WAP, including the ability to place them pretty much anywhere you want in your home if they are PoE enabled. They also provide another way of managing all of the devices connected to your wireless network and can even be set up to use a guest network as well. You can even get some wireless access points which are designed to be placed outside so you can extend your Wi-Fi network out to your backyard if you really want to. Although not used very much these days, phone line networking was cheap, easy to install and relatively fast. The fact that it didn't require any additional wiring as well was also a bonus. Home PNA makes use of the existing telephone wiring found within your home. Phone line networking is more commonly referred to as home PNA as it meets the specifications that were laid out by the Home Phone Networking Alliance. The HPNA is a collection of companies that came together 
to build the specification for phone line based networking. The first iteration of HPNA operated at just one megabits per second, but the latest standards, HPNA 3.0, operates at 128 megabits per second. The chances of walking into a home and finding a HPNA network setup are pretty rare these days. There are simply other technologies that are more capable, more easily accessible, and cheaper than this very traditional setup. Powerline networking makes use of the existing electrical wiring found within the walls of your home to provide a network connection. Using a set of Powerline adapters really couldn't be easier. You'd first take the primary adapter plug it into an available wall outlet that's near your router, and then take an ethernet cable and connect the power line adapter with the router. You then need to place the second adapter in the area of your home where you're looking to extend your connection, and then either connect your device to the adapter, again using an ethernet cable, or wirelessly if it has a Wi-Fi function built into it. Now there are several questions that commonly get asked when it comes to power line networking. The first is whether they use a lot of electricity as they're typically left powered on all the time. Power line adapters actually use very little electricity, so they're a very cheap and efficient way of extending a network connection. Based on the research I've done, a lot of power line adapters can use as little as just two watts of power. Compare this to other electrical appliances in your home like your TV or games console, which can use several hundred watts of power, it's easy to see how efficient power line adapters are. Some people will also want to know if power line adapters can work across different electrical circuits. The conclusion I came to based on my research is that they can work across multiple circuits, but you'll likely see quite a big performance drop. Power outlets are also in high demand throughout all of our homes, so could you plug a power line adapter into an extension cord if you had to? Again, this should be avoided if you can, as using power line adapters through extension cords can result in a performance drop. And depending on the type of extension cord that you're using, some may block the power line signal altogether. My advice would be to plug your power line adapter directly into a wall outlet wherever you can. Finally, some people have asked how many power line adapters you can use as part of a single network. Now there isn't a set limit, but you will be limited by the number of wall outlets that you have available and your total bandwidth. If you have less bandwidth available, you may want to limit the number of adapters that you use so the ones you are using get the best possible performance. Even though power line adapters provide a cheap and convenient way of extending a network connection, there are a few limitations to using them. The biggest limiting factor that can affect the performance of a power line network is the quality of the electrical wiring found within your walls. Now, there isn't really any way you can test this, so it is a case of buying a pack of power line adapters and just trying them out. Now, I recently invested in power line adapters myself. Uh, I'll leave a link to the review of them in the corner of the screen there, and I found them to perform very well. But again, I might have just got lucky with the electrical wiring here. Your typical home network will usually only involve having one router, but adding a second into the mix gives you more options for both expanding and managing your entire home network. Not only can it improve both the coverage of wired and wireless connections, but you can also see a performance boost as well. Some of the key benefits you get from adding a second router to your home network include more connectivity for both wired and wireless devices, better support for mixed wired and wireless setups, the ability to isolate certain devices, improved wireless coverage overall, and having a backup device in case one of them fails. Now there are two different connection types when it comes to setting up a second router. These are LAN to LAN and LAN to WAN. LAN to LAN extends your existing network connection to the second router and allows you to continue using the same SSID. This type of setup will allow you to share files between devices regardless of which of the two routers they're connected to. LAN to WAN works slightly differently in that it creates a second network within your primary network. This allows you to place restrictions on only the devices that connect to this secondary network but it won't support the sharing of files across devices that are connected to the two separate networks. Now I have a dedicated video that guides you through how to add a second router to your network. But if you don't fancy doing this, you could either consider investing in a network switch for more ethernet connections or a wireless access point to improve your wireless coverage. So here is a quick recap of the nine different network layouts that we've discussed. 
First you have wireless only, which relies 100% on Wi-Fi. Then you have ethernet only, which again relies solely on ethernet. Mixed wireless and ethernet make use of both at the same time and is the most commonly used. Direct to modem provides a single device with access to the internet, but is 100% not recommended and should be avoided at all costs. Add in a network switch increases the number of ethernet ports that are available to you. Add in a wireless access point can improve the coverage of the Wi-Fi signal. Phone line networking makes use of the existing telephone wiring. Power line networking makes use of the existing electrical wiring found in your walls. And a two router setup can improve both wired and wireless coverage for all of your devices. Now my personal home network makes use of both Wi-Fi and ethernet. Wherever possible, I've provided my most used devices like my gaming PC and my TV with an ethernet connection to provide it the best possible performance. Then I've kept the Wi-Fi connection reserved for devices that can't support ethernet like my smartphone. I also have a network switch which has vastly increased the number of ethernet ports available to me rather than me having to rely on the very few that are found on the back of my router. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I've recently picked up some power line adapters to have a play with which I have seen great success with as well. So I hope you found this video helpful and you now have a better understanding on which home network layout may be best for you. If you did, be sure to drop it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Finally, head on over to homenetworkgeek.com when you get a chance as I have a ton of articles that cover everything home networking over there. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.